Thank you for joining us with Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. Each week, we invite you to send in your questions, and we'll explore the fascinating stories of the city of Mississauga together. Like, subscribe, and follow us, and stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Well, for this week's episode, uh, it's inspired by an inquiry we uh, recently received on an interesting personality from our past, somebody who lived kind of on the, the borders of Mississauga, uh, historic Mississauga. Um, and I, I thought uh, I'd combine it with a few other uh, inquiries we received uh, in the not so distant past on a couple of other interesting personalities, uh, per perhaps people we have uh, somewhat forgotten about in our history that had uh, fascinating stories to share. So uh, th this week's episode is three of those stories. Um, and so we're going to start off with the, the inquiry we received, and it was from Brian. And uh, uh, he was asking about the name origin for a small community known as Clareville. And Clareville is really, uh, it, it's uh, historically not in Mississauga, but it's right on the edge, uh, up on uh, in kind of the very uh, northeast corner of our city, uh, kind of steels and uh, up in that area, historically part of Toronto Gore, but really right on the borders of, of uh, historic Mississauga, historic Brampton or uh, uh, and and uh, Toronto. And so you kind of have this, this small community that is, is really uh, in recent years disappearing before our eyes under modern suburban development and industrial expansion and the like. And so historic Clareville is, is, is largely, uh, um, uh, has very few remnants left on the landscape today, although you can still find pieces if you're, if you're looking for it. But the question was, uh, the founding of Clareville and uh, whether it was true, it was founded by a French teacher. Well, uh, yes, in short, uh, it, it, it was. Um, but it's a fascinating story and one of the great names of local history as well. His uh, name is uh, Jean du Petit Pont de la Haye. Uh, there's, a, there's a handle for you. Uh, but uh, Jean du Petit Pont de la Haye was uh, born in 1799 in St. Malo, France. He moved to Britain to teach in 1828, and while he was there, he met Lieutenant Governor, the, met the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, Sir John Colborne. Colborne convinced him to come to Upper Canada, now Ontario, uh, to be the French master of the new Upper Canada College, uh, and De, De La Haye accepted that invitation and uh, arrived in Canada in 1829. Um, although during the, the academic year, he lived on campus with, uh, with his family. Uh, in 1840, he uh, acquired land uh, out in what became the Clareville area, really, again, the extreme northeast uh, section of the city of Mississauga, or just beyond our, our northeast borders in Toronto Gore. And, uh, and he, he required an, an extensive property there, which he referred to as Le Orme, or the Elms. Uh, it was west of uh, what was then known as Indian Line and south of Steeles in Toronto Gore Township. And in 1851, uh, he registered a plan for subdivision uh, for the community to be called Clareville. Clareville was named after the eldest child, uh, after his eldest child, uh, his eldest daughter, Claire. Uh, one of the main streets in the in the community was known as Alcides Street, which is named after his son, who uh, himself, the, the son Alcides, later became a physician in Toronto. Uh, in, in all, uh, De, De La Haye uh, and his wife, Marie-Rine Lefrancois, uh, they had seven children, um, Claire Elizabeth, Angelique Marie, Pauline Rosalie, Victorine Fidel, Marie Josephine, Cecile Albertine, and Alcide John. Uh, six daughters and one son. Um, uh, De La Haye himself was known as a generous and egalitarian man. Uh, he donated uh, church sites in Clareville to three different denominations, uh, Congregationalists in 1842, Methodists in 1846, and Roman Catholics in 1860. Uh, he was a director and majority, majority shareholder of the Albion Plank Road Company, which was incorporated in 1846, to build an improved road from Thistletown through Clareville and west into Peel County. And after De La Haye retired, he became a local justice of the peace and member of the Toronto Gore Township 
Council. Um, and so th this this is a, a, you know, not only just through the name, but just an interesting fellow who was very involved in his community, again, involved with uh, the fledging Upper Canada College uh, beginning in 1829 and uh, right up until his, uh, his uh, retirement. Um, Jean uh, Dupetit Pont de la Haye was called the father of Clairville and uh, uh, for obvious reasons, not only was it uh, the community developed on his, uh, on his property, but uh, uh, he became kind of just well-known personality within the community with how active he was involved. Uh, with the support of De La Haye, Clairville grew over time. Uh, by 1870, its population was about 175 people. And there were two hotels, two general stores, one butcher, one blacksmith shop, one tailor, one cabinet maker, and one steam-powered grist mill. Um, and uh, De La Haye himself passed away in 1872, uh, and he is buried in Toronto. And you can find out more information on uh, Jean Dupetit. Pont de la Haye at the Etobicoke Historical Society, www.etobicohistorical.com. Um, they have a great deal of information on this uh, uh, locally influential and significant uh, individual who helped found a, a community. Again, a community that has largely disappeared on our modern landscape today. Um, but its its early history is is uh, is a fascinating, if if a unique story of uh, you know one individual's contribution to uh, his larger community. And uh, although again it's disappearing today, the name Clairville is still uh, still recognized on landscape. Um, uh, through street names, park names, reservoir, etc. And so Clairville is still known, although perhaps its origins have become obscure over time. And that, again, rests with the story of uh, uh, Jean du Petit Pont de la Haye, who lived between 1799 and 1872. So from there, I thought we'd uh, delve into a couple of other intriguing individuals who uh, people may have heard about or, or been curious about how you know road names and place names uh, and the like and uh, a couple of you know significant ones that I thought we'd jump into that um, uh, may resonate with some some individuals were the story of uh, Colonel Francois Lu Louis Lassard uh, in Meadowvale and uh, uh, also the story of the Mississauga connection to Igor Guzenko. Uh, so for uh, uh, Colonel Lassard, uh, Francois Louis Lassard was born in Saint Roche, Quebec, in 1860. He was the son of Louis Napoleon Lassard and Jean, uh, Jane uh, Felicite McCutcheon. Uh, in 1901, he was made captain of the Royal Canadian Dragoons, which was a mounted company. He was very much uh, a horseman. Uh, and in 1970, uh, 1907, he was promoted colonel of the Dra Dragoons and also appointed adjutant of, of the militia. He became a brigadier general in 1911 and major general of the militia in 1912, while maintaining his rank as colonel with the Dragoons. So a very uh, kind of decorated uh, early military officer. Uh, when Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurie announced a contribution of volunteers for the South African War on October in October of 1899, Lassard led the calls for recruits in Quebec. He could not join the first contingent, which consisted of infantry, but he volunteered for special service and sailed with the sir with the uh, the troops to Cape Town. He found employment on the staff as the, as an Imperial Cavalry commander. Um, John Denton Pinkstone French, uh, 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 under the direction of, of uh, John Denton Pinkstone French, uh, he participated in the relief of Kimberley. After British leaders asked for a second Canadian contingent with mounted troops, two battalions of Canadian mounted rifles arrived in March 1900, and Lassard took up command of the 1st Battalion of the Royal Canadian Dragoons, which he led through 27 engagements during the South African War. Lassard's battalion was seen as a model for the cavalry school at the Stanley Barracks in Toronto, and upon Lassard's return to Canada, he was appointed as instructor, and as such, he relocated from uh, Quebec to Toronto. The courses he conducted there for the militia greatly influenced the development of early cavalry in Canada. Many benefited, too, from the lectures and courses he gave on staff duties, military law, tactics and strategies, and topography at the Canadian Military Institute. When the First World War broke out in 1914, many considered Lassard the ideal candidate to lead the 1st Canadian Division overseas. The command, however, went to Lieutenant General Edwin Alfred Harvey Alderson. Even before the war, Lassard's differences with Samuel Hughes, the Minister of the Militia and Defence, had become a serious obstacle to his advancement. 
Hughes favored the role of citizen volunteers at the expense of, a, of permanent force soldiers, whom he believed should be relegated to instructional roles. Lessard dissented greatly from Hughes' vision, and the two never came eye to eye. The result was Lessard was largely left out of the planning and the logistics around Canadian uh, Canada's contributions to the First World War. Um, Lessard had uh, several more confrontations with Hughes uh, while continuing to receive praise for his administrative skills. For six months in 1916, he went overseas to report on the training of Canadian forces. His findings highlighted the problems with Hughes' system of recruitment. Uh, and training, and he recommended improvements that would help Canadians integrate more easily into the units in the field. Hughes took no action, and the Liberal faction of the Union government did not support Lassard's directives. Prior to the highly controversial introduction of conscription in 1917, Lassard toured Quebec, camp uh, Quebec campaigning for recruits. Lassard was an avid supporter of conscription and of, and of the Conservatives under Arthur Meehan. Lassard's advocating for, uh, for harshly dealing with anti-conscription riots in Ottawa and Quebec City lost him favor among the public, and he became kind of an outcast in his native Quebec. Lassard married uh, Florence Lee uh, in 1882 in Quebec, and they had three children. He was known as a popular career soldier, but stir a stern disciplinarian, but a, and also eccentric and fond of grand displays. Uh, although the words of uh, the militia minister, Sidney Chilton Newburn, uh, he described Lassard as a fine type of Canadian citizen. In June of 1919, Lassard retired to a small farm just west of Toronto here in historic Mississauga within Meadowville Village. The former cavalry officer raised horses and judged at horse shows and was appointed a director of the CNE. He lived at what was called Rose Villa in Meadowville Village, uh, what we know today as the Goodrum Estate, uh, and his time in Meadowville was, in a sense, a sort of an exile. He helped raise funds for the building of the War Memorial in Streetsville and unveiled the Streetsville War Memorial, also giving a short address on July 1st of 1926. Lassard died uh, in 1927 of cancer and is buried at Mount Hope Cemetery in Toronto. And you can find more about the uh, kind of the remarkable life and times and career of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Colonel Francois Louis Lassard, who lived between 1860 and 1927 on the Canadian, uh, 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 Canadian Biography Dictionary online. From there, we go to a name that resonates down through history, and that being um, Igor Guzenko, a famous uh, Soviet defector here in Canada. Um, commonly remembered as a man who started the Cold War, at least they brought the reality of the Cold War attention to Canada and the West. Igor Sergeyevich Guzenko was born in Russia on January 13th of 1919. Following the Second World War, Gozenko worked in military intelligence, uh, and he worked as a cipher, a cipher clerk in the Soviet embassy in Ottawa. As such, Gozenko was privy to all sorts of secret activities of Soviet spy rings in Canada and abroad at a time when his country was considered an ally of the West. On September 5th of 1945, Gozenko defected, hiding under a shirt 109 documents, exposing operations in Canada, the United States, and Great Britain. Gazenko went to the Ottawa Journal newspaper, but the paper did not understand his bewildering message and sent him away, as did the Federal Minister of Justice. It was not until two days later, when Soviet agents were caught ransacking Gazenko's apartment, that he was taken seriously and put under the protection of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Igor and his wife Svetlana were forced to assume new identities. They settled in relative obscurity in Mississauga under the names of Stanley and Anna Kryzak, and their eight children were brought up to believe that they were Czechoslovakian immigrants. The few times that Igor did appear in public, he wore a white hood over, over his head for anonymity. Dubbed the hero in hiding, Gazenko wrote his memoirs, This Was My Choice in 1948, and a novel, The Fall of a Titan, for which he received the Governor General's Prize for Literature in 1954. Locally, however, there were uh, he was known to other people in the community under other aliases, including Clark and Anna Corby and Richard and Ann Brown. We've had all those names kind of references, but the most uh, familiar were Stanley and Anna Kryzak. And they actually appeared in the newspaper article uh, at times uh, under the name Kryzak as well. Guzenko died of a heart attack in June of 1982 and was buried at Spring Creek Cemetery in Clarkson in what was at first an unmarked grave. It was not until September of 2002 that the name Gazenko was publicly revealed in the headstone inscribed with the family's true identity. 
The documents Yuzenko provided led the Kellogg uh, Treasury Royal Commission in 1946. After five months of debriefing and hearings, 26 Canadians and Britons were arrested, 11 of whom were convicted. In the United States, as evidence led to the arrest of such figures such as Harry Gold and Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Yuzenko's re revelation sent shockwaves across the Western world that lasted for years as the arrest trials, investigations, and controversies grew. Russia had been stealing atomic secrets in order to accelerate its own nuclear technology and was, in fact, secretly hostile to the West. This led to a massive arms buildup in the Cold War, which lasted until the Soviet Union collapsed more than 40 years later. On the 50th anniversary of Gizenko's defection, Margaret Thatcher sent a telegram to Gizenko's wife, Svetlana, saying, when you and your husband crossed over to freedom, you began the long process that led to the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union. His revelation helped the West face up to the reality that the communist subver of communist subversion and tyranny. Those of us who later fought the battle for freedom to its climax in 1989 and 1991 were greatly in his debt and in yours. The Guzenko Kryzak family lived along Mississauga Road between Port Credit and Arendelle. And again, for more information, check out the Canadian Encyclopedia under, under Igor Sergeyevich Guzenko for just fascinating material on, on, on the story. There's a lot out there. You can find YouTube refer uh, YouTube uh, um, videos around his the interviews that he gave while wearing a, a bag over his head to conceal his identity. But uh, brave uh, individual, considering he had a wife and children at the time, to uh, make that walk and, and defect to... Uh, bring to light some of the, um, uh, the subversive activities that the Soviet Union was engaged in. So with that, uh, we uh, draw to a close on uh, the story of three interesting personalities from, uh, from historic Mississauga. Um, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Ask a Historian. Please keep sending in your questions. If there's people you're interested in, place names, etc. let us know. Uh, we'll explore them with you here on Ask a Historian. Uh, and uh, please remember to like, subscribe, and follow us to stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. And we'll see you next week on Ask a Historian. <laughs>